15. Are we ready? Huh? You're good. Are we good? Are we live? Think so. You think so? Hopefully. Let's see. Oh yeah, I can see myself right here. Hey folks, thanks for joining us. A uh, little bit of change tonight. It's Tuesday at 8.30 Mountain Time instead of Wednesday at 8 o'clock Mountain Time, but here's why. I'm sitting in this hotel room in Flagstaff, Arizona, and the, well, how do I say this? You all know where I'm going. I'm going elk hunting up in these big peaks up above Flagstaff. Season opens Friday. We're going in tomorrow, and there's no way we could carry all the production gear and lights and everything else and get a strong enough, steady enough connection to do elk talk live way up in the wilderness area. So... Appreciate you joining me, and I promise from now on, well, I can't promise that. We will try to stay on the schedule. Next week, we will be doing Wednesday night again. We'll be back at our old time, but anyhow, I'm all set up here. Um, I'm ready to take some questions. I want to talk to you, though, about this hunt <clears throat> that we're going on. So, we know that peak rut, we usually think about, oh, that's last half of September, maybe the first week of October. This hunt I'm going to go on starts October 6th. That's when the bulls are starting. Okay, the ruts uh, kind of waning. They're transitioning from peak rut to post rut. Some of the bulls are still going to go and check their cows. Some of them, especially the older bulls, are thinking, mm, I don't know how much time I want to spend with these cows. So, it's going to be a little bit different of a hunt. It's kind of be, going to be a hybrid between a peak rut hunt and a post rut hunt. If there are cows that are coming into their second cycle, we do know that at that time, we're, we're going to see some activity. We're going to have bulls bugling. So whether or not we find one, whether or not we tag one, who knows? But that's why we're doing this tonight. This is what we're up to. It's going to be a ton of fun. But before we get into this, I think we're on episode 19 or 20 of Elk Talk Live. And the great companies that make this happen are Bowtech, Leupold, Onyx, Onyx Maps, we call them, Tight Spot Quivers, Ripcord Arrow Rest, Black Gold Sites, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And the, the way most of you got notified was you have been texting Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131, or if you're in Canada, 393939, and you got the notification, hey, Randy's going at a different time tonight. So one other cool thing that Botech is doing, and Marcus is behind the camera here, I don't know how close I got to get so that you can see that, but if you go to BotechArchery.com, they have this really cool thing, it's called I'm a Bow Hunter. You know how lately on social media you're able to put a frame around your pictures? Well, go to BotechArchery.com, and you're gonna get, you're gonna see this pop up. Is there too much glare? We got it. Okay, and uh, you just click on that, and it's gonna add a frame to your uh, uh, picture, and you can post it on social media, everything else. You can kind of be, you know, telling the world, hey, I'm a bow hunter, I'm a conservationist, I'm a hunter. So, anyhow. We got a whole list of questions from last week that we didn't get to, and, and I apologize that we're not getting to all of the questions every week, but if you go across all the platforms, we're probably getting three to 400 questions. So for those of you who ask them, I really appreciate it. And for those of you who we don't get to, I'm sorry that we don't, but we try to get to them, and we try not to have the same questions that we've had in prior episodes. So. Uh, here's one, Skylar Burson. What's my opinion on lighted knocks? My opinion is whatever that state says is what it should be. My state of Montana just made them legal this year. I used them. I think they're actually helpful. Uh, for me, anyhow, in lower light, my eyes aren't that great. So I want to see where that arrow goes. I shot a grouse. It was cloudy. It was overcast. It was normally, I don't think I would have recovered that arrow. I saw it sticking in the dirt. So Whatever that state says, hey, that's the rule. I don't want to tell other states how to do things. I see nothing wrong with having lighted knocks. All right, uh, let's see. If you shoot an elk at dusk, boy, these are going, going <laughs> past so fast. Uh, hey, Tecla, uh, I saw you go through here. Uh, let's see. 
How close are you when you start to bugle? That's Jeremiah. I get as close as I can. So on this hunt that, that we're going to do starting this week, if I hear bugling, and I'm gonna, we're going to be up on these high ridges listening at it way before the sun comes up. And we're going to bugle. We're going to do some locating bugles. And if we hear them, we're going to move in as close as the wind will let us before daylight. And when it becomes daylight, this is a rifle hunt, not an archery hunt. I want to be in position to either call that bull closer or in position to take the shot right then and there. So let's see. What do you got, Marcus? Anything? Yeah. Uh, when you get your meat to a cooler, do you take the meat out of the game bags? When I get my meat to a cooler, do I take it out of the game bags? No. I leave it in my game bags all the time. One of the features and purposes of game bags is to keep your meat clean. And I don't care if you're handling it around coolers, around wherever, your tailgate. If you take it out of a game bag, it's going to get a little dirtier. It, it's going to be exposed to hair, to dirt, pine needles, all that kind of stuff. So I always leave my meat in the game bag until I get it to the processor. Uh, let's see. Boy, these are going by so fast. There's a ton of questions here for uh, for having it. Uh... Oh, is Arizona draw only for elk? Yes, it is. It's draw only for elk. Uh, non-residents, we are uh, limited to 10% of the non-resident elk tags, um, but there's a ton of opportunity here. There's some really good hunts that aren't that hard to draw, and I drew this one that I'm going on with four points. So it can happen to anyone. Arizona has a bonus point system. The archery hunts are fantastic hunts, but they're the hardest hunts to draw in Arizona. Well, with the exception of the early rifle and muzzle, early muzzleloader hunts. Those are the hardest to draw. But the archery hunts here can be very difficult to draw. But there's plenty of places to come here and hunt. If elk aren't bugling, what's the best way to find them? Get your Leopold binos, get your Leopold spotter, and look for them. That's how I find them when they're not bugling. You got one there, Marcus? Uh, yeah. Have you seen situations where wild horses are impacting deer and elk habitat on your hunt? Have I seen situations where wild horses are impacting deer and elk habitat on my hunts? Yes, in huge instances. We were in Nevada archery hunting last month, uh, well, in August. Tons of wild horses. They are definitely having a huge impact on the range. The Wild Horse and Burrow Act, which was passed, I think, in 70 or 71, said we're going to have 26,000 horses across all these management areas. Well, we're like three or four times that number, and it, it is having a serious impact. If we're going to take care of native species, because let's face it, feral horses are not a native species, but if we're worried about deer, elk, antelope, songbirds, sage grouse, stuff like that, pretty soon some hard decisions have to be made about what are we gonna do about wild horses? We can't continue to let a feral species continue to damage the habitat. And you see it, if you hunt Nevada, Utah, parts of Colorado, parts of Wyoming, uh, parts of New Mexico, burrows right here in Arizona, burrows are a big problem. So yeah, I see it a lot. Uh, let's see, have I hunted Unit 45 in Colorado? No, I haven't. I'm sorry about that, I've, I've not. So if I gave you any information on it, I'd just be making it up. Uh, all right. Boy, these are going by way too fast. I can't read this fast. Uh, what's my favorite state to bow hunt elk and why? Uh, yes. <laughs> Whatever state will give me a tag to bow hunt, that's where I'm going. Uh, I would say of the states that are easier to draw, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, some of those general archery elk tags are fantastic. I mean, they're over the counter, they might be leftover, or they're just general tags. Man, there are some good, really, really good archery elk hunts in those places. Yeah, we all know about the great archery elk hunts in New Mexico, here in Arizona, in Nevada, in Utah. Don't overlook those three northern states because what the dynamic of how it works in archery season is you have most of the high country is public, the lower valleys are private. Well, in archery season in September, where are the cows? The cows are up high. So where are the bulls? They're up high, which puts them on the public land. It gives you an opportunity to chase bulls that maybe you won't have a crack at if you wait till October and November when they're down lower, which is mostly private. So, What do you use for a Winchester? 
What do I use for a wind checker? I don't know. I just have a little plastic bottle with some talc powder in there. And see which way the wind is blowing. If I forget it, and I've lost mine on many occasions, I'll grab some duff off one of the, you know, a lot of the plants this time of year, they're dried out. They have like a dead flower on top. I, I'll do that. Uh, I'll take the finest dust I possibly can. But good to have a wind checker. I don't care if you're rifle hunting, archery hunting. You cannot fool the nose of an elk. They will trust their nose more than they will their eyes and their ears. They're almost like an old cagey whitetail buck in that sense. Don't overlook scent and smell when you're hunting these bull elk. Let's see. Oh, gosh. Some of these are, are would take me all day to, to answer them, especially these ones about uh, things. Oh, Wyoming... 19-2, where do you look for bulls? <laughs> James Harn. Uh, a lot of you know that I've had the 19, unit 19-2 19 tag in Wyoming three times. Uh, you can go out on our uh, YouTube channel and watch it. You can watch it on... Uh, oh, now we're on Amazon Prime. If you get Amazon Prime, seasons four and five of Fresh Tracks are out there. We're loading up season three. And right now we're filming season six and some of that stuff's going to go up on Amazon Prime. So if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, all of our stuff that we're loading up, just write, uh, type in and search Fresh Tracks or Randy Newberg. Uh, it's free out there on Amazon Prime. But in Unit 19-2, if there's snow and you want to go, I always hunt it the last five days of season. Just like I do any of my November hunts, I want to hunt them as late in the season as I can. Uh, so I hunt the last five days of the season. Usually they will migrate south. And if you can get them coming south off some of that private land, that's where we've shot all the bulls. So, Do you have any recommendations for a spike hunt, and a spike only hunt in Idaho? Do I have recommendations for a spike only hunt in Idaho? In, in other words, a place to go or I tactics? I assume tactics, but um, didn't specify. If it's spike only, I would go and look for cows. Uh, the, the spikes are going to be with the cows. They're year and a half old bulls. They might get bumped away a little bit during the archery season, during the rut, but they come right back with the cows as quick as the rut's over. I would go and look for cows. And like I always say, cows are looking for the best food on the mountain 24-7, 365 days a year. Go find the best food on the mountain or out on the prairie, wherever you're hunting, and that's where you're going to find cows, and that's where you're going to find the spikes. All right, this one... Six to ten inches of snow has fallen in Colorado where I hunt first, first rifle season. Ooh. What would that do to the elk up high? Six to ten inches of snow first rifle season in Colorado. What's that going to do to elk up high? It's going to make them easier to see. Uh, your first rifle season in Colorado is it's going to be a week after this hunt. You're going to have even you're going to be even closer to that uh, like transition from peak rut to, to post rut. Uh, 6 to 12 inches is not enough to get a big bull elk to, to migrate. They're still going to be in the same place as they would have been without snow. It's just going to be a lot easier to see them because of the snow. It's going to be easier to see their tracks and read what they're doing. But they're going to be doing the same thing that they would be. And in this case, they might be going around checking some cows. But for the most part, they're gonna, the older bulls are going to start drifting off to themselves, going into sanctuary mode trying to recoup after the rut. They'll still be in that period where there's some bugling and there's some activity near cows, but that's not going to be their primary source of, of, I guess, activity and interest. Let's put it that way. Have I elk hunted in Oregon? No, I have not. Uh, just, I haven't. What's my favorite unit for elk in New Mexico? Whichever one they give me a tag for. <laughs> New Mexico gives you three choices. You can mix them by weapon type. You can mix them by seasons. So they look at your three choices before they go on to the next person. So I always put a really hard one as my first choice, a pretty hard one as my second choice, and a pretty probably the easiest one I'd be willing to hunt. And when I say hard, hard, easy, I'm talking the draw odds. I put in for the easiest draw odds that I would be willing to hunt as my third choice because they might say, oh, that one's filled up, that quota's on that one's filled up. Oh, guess what, Randy, your third choice is open, boom, I get a tag. So I don't really have a quote unquote favorite unit in New Mexico. I've hunted a lot of them. I've helped people with tags in a lot of them and I love them all. Uh, let's see, have I hunted Grey Bull, Wyoming? Not for elk, I haven't. Uh, 
I've hunted, let's see, Grey Bull, if you went north and east of there uh, by Lovell, I've hunted the north end of the Bighorns, and then I've hunted the south end of the Bighorns, but I've never hunted the Grey Bull area myself, or uh, for elk. I have for whitetails. If you watched our YouTube channel or our TV uh, episodes, it just aired a couple of weeks ago, it's called Wyoming Whitetails. We were hunting out of Grey Bull. That should be a hint of where we were. And we saw some big elk actually down in the sagebrush. Like, whoa. Uh, Renee asks, any Canadian hunts planned for your show? Unfortunately not. Uh, you know that we do all self-guided, all public land hunts. And in Canada, for just about every species, you have to hire an outfitter. So that doesn't quite fit the format of our show. One of my dreams is to go to Canada and hunt mountain caribou, and someday I'm going to do it. And I'm going to have to hire an outfitter. I don't have any problem with that at all. Uh, if you want to hire an outfitter, go do it. But the premise of our show, just trying to show people how much opportunity exists, is all self-guided. So that doesn't work in Canada for uh, us Yanks down here south of the 49th parallel. So what do you got, Marcus? Um, is a 270 win enough to take down an elk in your opinion? Is a 270 win enough to take down an elk in your opinion? Well, the first four bull elk I shot, I killed with a, 200, uh, a 270, shooting 150 grain nozzler partition bullets. All four of them were one-shot kills that maybe went, I think the furthest one maybe went 30 yards. So hopefully that answers your question. It's all about quality bullets. It's about shot placement. Make sure you're accurate. A 270 is a very manageable recoil, very accurate round. I wouldn't hesitate to hunt elk any place, any time with a 270, as long as I have really good bullets. And when I'm talking really good bullets, you hear me talk about the nozzler partitions, the E-tips, and the acupons. To me, those are three premium elk bullets that give me confidence. So go with it, and you'll be just fine. All right. <laughs> John, please let me hunt with you. Uh, I, I appreciate that, John. I get hundreds of invitations here, unfortunately. Uh, I just can't take people up on all of them. Uh, I'd love to. I, I love hunting with new people, learning new, you know, building new relationships, new friendships, but just uh, doesn't doesn't work out. So unfortunately, uh, am I going to do a late season hunt in Colorado this year? Unfortunately, I'm not. Our calendar has us in Arizona for deer, Montana for deer, and Nevada for desert bighorn sheep in. In November so uh, next year I'm gonna try to get to Colorado for the late elk hunt or the third season elk hunt you guys all see me I love to hunt third season versus second season there's just fewer people in the woods the winter is usually arrived a little bit better by the time third season comes it's two weeks later uh, it's just what I like to do so what's a good backpack for two to three day hunts that will haul some meat uh, I'm going to find out tomorrow. No, actually, I know. I have Mystery Ranch backpacks. What we do is we will go in and we'll, we use Metcalfs or Marshalls. Those are the two models we use on the Mystery Ranches. And this hunt here is going to be, I'm hauling in enough food, supplies, everything for five days, plus all our production gear. So I'm using my Marshall on this hunt. It's a little bit bigger. But normally I use the Metcalf. You can carry two to three days worth of stuff. And when you come out, if, if your body can withstand the weight, you can get some meat down there easily. And I use it for a day pack. It folds up really flat, and it allows you to, uh, the compression that it flattens it comes undone, and you can put a full hind quarter of an elk in that pack when you need to come out. There's no sense in going in, shooting an elk, having to come back and get a different pack. Use a pack that can be converted to both, and that's why I use these uh, Mystery Ranch uh, Metcalf and sometimes Marshall. So, you got another one, Marcus? Yeah, how many states do you apply for each year? How many states do I apply for each year? That's a good question. Let's count them Alaska, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, uh, let's see, Iowa, usually Kansas. Uh, and I, I, uh, Kentucky for elk, 
I used to apply in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine for moose, but I kind of dropped those. So what's that? 12 states, I guess, for me. And then with our guest hunters or family and friends, uh, I'm applying them for tags. And, and that's why you see in the show, a lot of times I'm not the guy with the tag. A lot of times we have other family or other friends who have the tag. When, when we get done with this trip here, we're going back to Montana. My son has the tag. So we, uh, we need 12 to 15 tags in a year to film a whole season. So we, we apply for a lot. And we don't always apply for these quote unquote glory tags. We apply for mid tier and lower tags. And we know even with that, we're not going to get them all. So we're going to have to fill it in with some over the counter or general tags. Let's see, do I ever use trail cameras when elk hunting and check during the season or several days before? I don't. I don't even own a trail camera. And the reason is in Montana, they're illegal. So you cannot use a trail camera in Montana during any period that you have a valid hunting tag. So I guess I could set them out in June, July and up until my archery antelope starts on August 15th. But so... I'm not a I'm not a trail cam guy. A lot of people ask me that, and it just uh, where I live, it just doesn't make sense. So, uh, do you think a sanctuary area could be less than a mile from a road, depending on seclusion? Could a sanctuary area for post rut and late season be more be less than a mile from a road, based on seclusion? Yes. Some of you have seen me do it. So there's a place I hunt. I'm not going to say what state. I have about six or 700 feet of really steep vertical. And when I get up there, it's a bench that's about a half mile wide and two miles long. And when I get up there, I can hear car doors slamming. I can hear ATVs driving down below me. I, it's quite uh, noisy. But the elk, it's a really steep face and there's just this bench that goes up above the Forest Service Road the elk stack in there because just like you, the, the question is asked, is it secluded? Yes. Nobody wants to climb that probably six or 700 feet of vertical to get up on the bench. They all want to go way, way back where the forest service road takes them. The number of elk that are stacked. And I'm only three quarter of a mile from the trailhead when I get there. Let's see. Uh, what HD region, hunting district region, do you recommend for elk? Oh, I don't know what state that is, so I can't answer that. Uh, late season wilderness hunt, no horses. How to keep warm uh, in the jaw bridge of, of Nevada, or jar bridge. Uh, late season wilderness hunt with no horses, you need to layer properly. And you need to bring at least one extra set of clothes that you can rotate because one day you're going to get all sweated up. You need to be able to get a new layer that is, is in some way, shape, or form dry. Uh, I use merino wool. You'll see I wear this Sitka gear. It evaporates and, and draws moisture out really quickly. That's, it's those kind of hunts that you're talking about where performance clothing saves the day. You go in there, yeah, you get sweated up. Guess what? I'm going to pull that moisture away from my body with high performance clothing and I'm going to stay warm. I go back, I sleep in my tent that night. Maybe I bring in one extra merino wool top, an extra pair of socks. If I'm one of those people who need a bottom, uh, I'll bring an extra uh, merino wool bottom. I use the heavier timberline pants, so I don't need a bottom in a lot of places. So it's all about layering. Every bit of it is about layering. And you can carry one extra layer on a backpack hunt, even if you don't have horses. You got one? Yeah, what's your favorite elk dish and your favorite pronghorn dish? My favorite elk dish and my favorite pronghorn dish. Let's start with pronghorn. My favorite thing in the world, and if my wife was not so camera shy, we would do this recipe. She has the best lasagna recipe, hands down. Everyone who eats my wife's antelope lasagna wants the recipe. I need to get it. I need to somehow post it out on my Facebook page or something because it's spectacular. That's my favorite antelope meal. My favorite elk meal is, well, and unfortunately tenderloins are only about that long and about that big around. Uh, I love to take a tenderloin, just put it in a, a rub. I use these dog day spice rubs 
and I slow cook it on my grill. And as it gets to this level of just about medium, maybe not quite, I'm just slicing off the pieces and letting it kind of work its way through there because you don't want to overcook any wild game. And when I'm done, usually there's not much left to bring into the dinner table because I've been sitting there at the grill. <laughs> but that's my favorite way. Uh, I would say if not that, uh, obviously back straps. I love to marinate the back straps and then just grill them. I cut mine pretty thin. A lot of people will cut a really thick elk steak and to get it to the level of, of uh, cook that they want, the outside gets so done and so dry that it's really not what you want. It gets tougher and drier. So I cut mine thin, I still marinate them, and I don't cook them for very long. So that's, that's what I do with elk. I love it. In fact, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. I have no elk left in my freezer. I have to kill an elk on this hunt. Randy could starve. His family could be down on the street corner if he does not shoot an elk on this hunt. No, not really. But, uh, all right. What do you rec recommend for binoculars and a scope? Uh, binoculars, I have uh, the new Leupold BX4. I have these 10 by 50s. I'm really liking them. I just got them this year. As far as scope, I think you're talking about rifle scope. Uh, the gold rings that I use, uh, you'll see that on my all of my rifles, all my howes, I have Leupold gold rings. Anywhere from the VX3i on some of them. Uh, this year, my 308, I put a VX5 on it. That is a 3 to 15. And then a couple of them, I have the VX6 HD. And the VX5 is HD also. The VX6s, I have all 2 to 12s. Uh, a lot of people prefer to 3, three to 18. But when we're filming, we have to get closer than than what most hunters have as their set range because you don't want to see us take a really long shot where it's just this little pin on the screen this little dot so we try to get closer and that's why i like the 2 to 12. they're on ultra lightweight mountain rifles the scopes themselves are lighter than a a, a bigger magnification scope so it works really good for me but vx3 i gold ring vx5 or vx6 from leupold those are the ones that i go with so uh let's see what do we got you got anything marcus yeah um, what, what are your thoughts on coyotes and their effect on elk birthing areas have you ever seen an impact where you hunt what are what what are my thoughts on coyotes and the impacts on elk birthing areas what have i seen and how does it affect my hunt uh i've never seen coyotes have an impact on elk calving i i could be wrong i it, it may happen but if you've ever seen a cow elk after she has her calf, she's almost as ornery as a cow moose. So I don't know that coyotes are that big a deal. Black bears? Oh my goodness. Black bears, they are serious, and grizzly bears, serious predators on elk calves during that little pulse of period when all the calves are, are being dropped in this, you hope in this two week period because the predators can only eat so many and they gorge themselves. If you get a spread out calving period, say you have the rutting period gets extended, so you're having caps drop, dropping early and dropping late and in between, well, that's a much longer period of time for wolves and bears and other predators, lions, to eat more calves. So you want a really compressed spike of calving. As far as uh, uh, coyotes, I've never seen an impact. Not saying they don't, it's just, my observation, I haven't seen it, so. How do you quietly hunt grouse during rifle elk season? How do I quietly hunt grouse during rifle elk season? You don't. You're grouse hunting during rifle elk season and you shoot the grouse. But when we were in Wyoming two weeks ago, we saw a blue grouse and the crew would not let me shoot it. They threw this line at me. Oh, you can't shoot a blue grouse with a rifle. I'm like, Oh, I didn't look that up in the regs to see if you could or couldn't, so I didn't do it. But I, if I see a grouse, I'm shooting it. I don't care if it's rifle season or what. It, it's a grouse. You shoot them. The, the elk aren't going to care. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. So, uh, Can I buy an over-the-counter third season elk tag in Colorado? Is there a deadline? No. You, there is no deadline. You can go online to Colorado Parks and Wildlife and buy it. You can go to a licensed vendor and buy it, 
But understand, if you get there after the season has already opened, the only way you can buy your tag is to get it from a division, uh, Parks and Wildlife office. So you'd have to go to one of their offices to buy it if you get there to buy the tag after the third season is already underway. So, what is my go-to energy food when hunting? Dairy Queen. <laughs> no. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a combination of things. I, I try to mix up some of my own trail mixes. Uh, I got this weird diet because of this crazy liver condition I have, so uh, I'm not a good guy to ask for for food tips. I have a uh, a lot of restrictions of how I have to do it because of my liver situation. So, um, but uh, as we're doing this, uh, just want to make sure everybody understands that we are so lucky to have companies like Bowtech and Leupold and Onyx and tight spot and ripcord and black gold if you're in the market for buying products they make i hope that you will go and do it they don't they, they, this is all them they have just said randy if we do all this will you sit down and do it for half hour 40 minutes every week and i'm happy to but these companies are investing a lot of money in distributing this so I hope you'll support them. They support us in our public land and our self-guided hunting things that we do. And uh, also, please go to Amazon Prime and watch our stuff there. It is it is taking off so good, and we're going to be loading more and more. Oh, the other thing is a lot of times we can't get to your uh, all your questions here. And a lot of the questions that, have, that get asked, we've also had... Uh, on our hunt talk forum we have a forum called hunttalk.com where people ask all kinds of questions share stories and everything else so every once in a while i'll do a podcast so you you may know or may not know we do a podcast every other week called hunt talk radio you can get it on stitcher or itunes but every once in a while we'll be accumulating questions like we got here and we will ask a, a answer a bunch of those questions on the hunt talk podcast so if we're not getting to your question here or you want to just listen to them because there's good information and probably questions you might have had in your mind, uh, go to the, the Hunt Talk Radio podcast and download those and you'll get a lot of information there also. Uh, you got one, Marcus? Um, yeah. Have you ever found any socks that, keep, uh, your, that will keep sweaty feet dry and warm? Have I ever found any socks that will keep sweaty feet dry and warm? Yeah. They're called Kenetrek. I got a whole bag full of them over there. Uh, Kenetrek has this wool blend sock that is just off the charts. That's what I use. I, I use them exclusively. Uh, they will wick moisture. You just got to make sure that you're doing the right thing with your socks. You got to make sure you aren't letting your feet get sweated up before you even get on the trailhead. If, you have, if you're one of those people with really sweaty feet, bring an extra pair of socks in your pack to switch through at the middle of the day. Amazing what a difference it'll make. Uh, Wyoming elk, first week in November. Calling? Question mark? No, I'm not calling in November. I've been there before and had some bugling go on in November, but they're always really young bulls that are doing that bugling. So, no, first week in November. I'm setting up, I'm glassing, it's all binoculars and spotting scopes and spot and stock. That's for me. Because elk are in that, at that point, they're in the late, uh, late season period and they're in their sanctuaries. They're in the places that most people don't want to go. So calling's not going to do you much good at all. Uh, let's see. What can you leave at home versus must bring with you out hunting? Oh, that's... That's way too long to ask, but it's worthwhile because so many people ask this. We did we go out to our YouTube page, Randy Newberg Hunter, and there's a ton of bag dump videos on there. And we have a different kind of bag dump for archery hunt, a different for rifle, different for elk, different for mule deer. Uh, there's a lot of things there that I won't leave home without. And what you see there is 25 years of, of, of backcountry hunting kind of sorting out what has worked for me and what hasn't worked based on my style of hunting. Now, if you have a different style of hunting, your bag or your, your pack might be filled with a few different things. But, got any more, Marcus? Yeah, what 
size and how many coolers do you need to transport an elk home? What size and how many coolers do I need to transport an elk home? So most of you know that I use Orion coolers. If I have one elk and it's fully boned, if I have four of the 65 quarts, uh, I try to go with two 65s and two 85s. I can easily get a boned out elk in there. But remember, I don't put it in there until it's cooled and hung for at least a night and the temperature of the meat has dropped significantly. And then I put ice on top. And the reason I put it block ice or, or milk jug, frozen milk jugs on top, cold air drops. If you put it on the bottom, you'd be surprised the temperature difference between the bottom of the cooler versus the top of the cooler. So I can usually get by with four of the 65 quarts, and that's because I like to put a lot of ice on them. I suspect if you really squeeze it, you could probably get it in even less if you boned and trimmed it really well. Let's see. Do you glass all day or just mornings and evenings? Uh, I try to glass all day. Uh, there's times where we might go to a glassing point, we glass it all morning, and we say, dang, this didn't work out. There's really, this is not what we thought it was. So I might hike out the afternoon and around lunch and go to a different spot. So in those times, I won't be glassing all day. But if this is one of those spots where I know there are elk and I'm confident, you know what, they are here, I just gotta find them, I'll be on those binos or on that spotter all day long. Right from dark daylight all the way to dark. What backpacking stove do you use when hunting? I don't bring a backpack stove. Uh, if you're talking about uh, cooking a little for cooking, not heat, uh, I bring jet boils. Uh, I know guys who use MSRs. It's, any of them work fine. It's just a matter of what you have. But the, when I'm backpack hunting, like I'm going to go in here, I'll be bringing my jet boil with me tomorrow with one little can of fast gas, and that'll last me a whole week. Uh, what do we got, Marcus? How do you handle constantly swirling winds while bow hunting? How do I handle constantly swirling winds while bow hunting? Not very well. <laughs> uh, it's hard. That's the challenge in the mountains. I know a lot of guys who come from the east, oh, the wind's always out of the west or always out of the southwest. Not in the mountains. The mountains with thermals, with clouds, just a cloud coming over and blocking the sun changes the temperature 10 degrees. Your thermal strength or thermal direction might lessen or, or strengthen, or it might slightly change direction. That's why I carry that wind checker right here in my bino pouch. It's just like always checking the wind. I, when it's swirling, it's just a bad deal. I don't know any other way to say it. So. What's your secret for drawing tags? I've never drawn in 17 years now. I think they just throw my application away. What is my secret for drawing tags? I've never drawn in 17 years. I think they throw my application away. I don't know what state you're talking about. My secret is let the other people apply for the quote unquote glory tags. I mean, here in Arizona, these early rifle tags, your odds are less than 1%. Well, guess what? If it's less than 1%, 17 years isn't, you're not even a fifth away there. So look at the odds, figure out, all right, how does this drawing system work? If it's a state that has a point system, whether bonus points or preference points, as much as it costs some money to participate in those, that's going to get you further up the point pile. It's going to increase your probability. That's how I do it. But I don't go for these high level, super duper tags. I go for these mid tier ones or even lower. I just have to. So if, if you want to hunt, look at it and say, all right, what's my plan? Okay, maybe in some state or for some species in my home state, I'm going to swing for the fences. But on the other species or in other states, I want to make sure I get a tag. So I'm going to lower my expectations and I'm going to apply for a tag that's easier to draw. So. Uh, do you prefer calling or stalking while bow hunting? Calling all day long. It's way more fun. But sometimes you'll see in some of our videos, I end up doing spot and stock. But, uh, Randy, your bow, uh, what spare bow accessories repair kit do you bring on a long hunt? Uh, actually what I do, and, and I know some people say, oh, I can't do this. I have a second bow. Uh, I have a backup, I have a Bowtech, uh, is that one, let's see, it's an experience or a prodigy. prodigy? 
Yeah, Marcus reminded me, my old the one before that. So I have a second bow, uh, but at the truck, I have a spare everything. I have a spare rest, I have a spare release. Uh, I don't have a spare quiver. I have a spare sight, uh, knocks, broadheads, uh, D-loop, you name it, I have a spare back at the truck. Uh, I can't carry, I can't justify carrying all that in on a backpack hunt. So I just know if I have a problem, and I've never have, never had a failure with my Botex, uh, when, when I do a backpack hunt, I, I don't bring all the spares with me. If I did, I know that I'd have to walk back out to my truck and I would probably have something in my, I have just this little, I don't know what size toad it is, it's about that big. It's the old crap kit, something went wrong but I've never had to use it while I'm out on a hunt. So, uh, Scott Jones and yourself deer hunting in Nevada this year with some good footage. Thank this guy right here, Marcus. Uh, that's out on our YouTube channel. We filmed that in August and we put it up as a day by day live hunt. Uh, those of you who watched it, thanks for watching it. Uh, wish the outcome would have been different, but you know, we just tell the story of how it, how it happened. So, uh, Let's see. You got anything else, Marcus? Yeah, I'm... do you glass south or west facing slopes, warmer slopes for late season bulls? Do I glass south or west facing west facing warmer slopes for late season bulls? Yep, I do. I, a lot of times they will be either on those slopes or they'll be along some edge of timber or some rock pile or some brush or something. Because if it's super cold, and in my home state of Montana, our season runs till the Sunday after Thanksgiving. It can be really, really cold some years by then. And those bulls are feeling it, especially if we've had a bunch of snow pile up. Yeah, I'm looking at some of those south, mostly southwest or southeast uh, or full west. Uh, a lot of times in those periods, those bulls are not going to be on the north slope or the northeast slope. So don't, don't overlook those if it's late season. Randy, did you pick up a bear tag for your Arizona hunt? No, I didn't. Uh, every time we try to do multiple things in one hunt, we end up doing every one of them very poorly. So uh, we were down at the Game and Fish office here in Flagstaff today talking to folks, getting some intel. And they said, oh, you know, bear season's open the same period, right? I'm like, don't even tell me that. I'll be distracted. So no bear tag in my pocket for this hunt, even though they're over the counter and I, and I could have bought one. Uh, Randy, are you going to do a day by day for bear next year like you did this year? Yeah, he's referring to uh, out on our YouTube channel. We did a day by day for 12 days. We'd go out and film at night. Next morning, we'd come into the office, tell the story of what happened the night before. We're going to do the same thing. Uh, we're also going to go to Alaska next spring. So we're going to have a day by day Alaska version also. Uh, oh, gosh. Boy, there's so many of them. When is my book coming out? I think the publishing company's given up on me. Uh, I signed a deal with them a year and a half ago under the premise that, it might have been two years ago, that I might not ever get to it. And they said, don't worry about it. So I've found that it's easier for us to do video than it is for me to sit down and just crank on the keyboard. So a lot of the stuff that was going to go in the book, you can find out on our YouTube channel. A bunch of it Botech is promoting out on their uh, BotechArchery.com website about the five calendar periods of elk hunting, early season, pre-rut, peak rut, late, uh, post-rut, and late season. That's the core of what that book was going to be about. And uh, you can find it out on, uh, out on the internet at this point. So... Uh, you got anything else? Yeah. We, we're, we're running late here, but since everybody was so kind to join a day early and a half hour later, I thought, you know what? Let's give them a, a bit extra here. Do you need anything special to do anything special with a cape to keep it suitable for a taxidermist when you're three to four days away from delivering it? Do I need to do anything with a cape when you cape out your animal? If you're three to four days away from delivering to your taxidermist, some people will try to salt it. Unless you know what you're doing, don't try to salt it because you got to split the lips, you got to turn the ears, all kinds of stuff. Get it someplace cool, keep it cool. If you can get it on ice, get it in a fridge, get it in a freezer. 
some way to keep it cool. Three to four days, if it's cool, usually you can do it. If you can't, you're going to have to hike out and you're going to have to go somewhere that has a fridge or a freezer. I've seen people salt their own capes and if you don't know what you're doing, you can screw it up as much as you can help it. So that's, that's what I do. I never salt my own capes. I find some way to either keep them cool or get them to a fridge freezer setup. Let's see, bear beard time. No, my wife doesn't like my bear beard. I can't hardly, I'm, I'm no good at growing a beard anyhow, so. Where is the Wyoming whitetail hunt? Can't seem to find it. Go out, who is asking that? Uh, Steven, go out to Amazon Prime. It's out on Amazon Prime season five. It's out on our YouTube channel and it's gonna be coming up a couple times again here uh, in, let's see, I think later this month and then again in November out on Sportsman's channel. So, unit 15 in New Mexico, have you ever hunted this unit? Not for elk, for antelope I have, but not for elk. So I've hunted units around there, but I've, I've never hunted that one. Uh, let's see, December cow hunt in Idaho in the sagebrush, any advice? Yeah, go to where the, the feed is the thickest, the luscious, and the best. And that's hard to tell in a unit. But in those sagebrush units, usually you're going to have some sagebrush where there's grass growing up in between it. And those are the places the cow elk are going to go. Some sagebrush is just bombed out. There's no grass. There's nothing but snow stacked up there. That's not where the elk are going to go. So look for the places that have a yellow tinge to it. That's the places the elk are going to be, or the cow elk are going to be looking for food. Guys, keep asking, what camera would you recommend for self-filming hunts on a budget? What camera would I recommend for self-filming hunts on a budget? Uh, depends on what that budget is. Um, I would maybe think about some of these mirrorless cameras. I have a Sony mirrorless camera. They have a version of 6000 and a 6300. They take unbelievable videos. They're small. The batteries don't cost a ton. It's it, it a lot of the stuff, not a lot, but some of the stuff you see in our show is shot with those. Um, you're, you'll have to get a special lens to reach out there a ways. Um, the audio isn't going to be that great. So if you're going to step up to a camera that has a really good zoom that you can put external audio on, you're going to double or triple your price. So if I was you, I'd either go get one of the little handy cams, the Sony or Canon down at Best Buy, four or five hundred bucks might work exactly for what you need. Otherwise, I'd think about these mirrorless cameras. I'm finding them to be a very good in-between option. Uh, the higher end mirrorless cameras with the lens and a bunch of batteries and everything else, you can get for under a thousand bucks. Whatever you do, no matter how you use it or what you do it with, have it on a tripod. Don't run the zoom back and forth. It gets people seasick, the footage is crappy. Put it on a tripod and slowly zoom or don't zoom at all. Or if you're zoomed, slowly come back. Don't race that zoom back and forth. So those are the, the things that I would suggest. What's my best experience with conservation officers? I've never had a bad experience with a warden or conservation officer. The best experience you'll see if you go out to our YouTube channel, there's a Wyoming elk hunt in season four of On Your Own Adventures. I think it's season four. Oh, yeah, uh, Aaron, the Wyoming <laughs> game warden, pulled me out. I was stuck, and he chained up and he winch or drug me up this little icy, super icy hill. That was a super nice thing for him <laughs> to do. So I've never had a bad experience. I, these people, they they do great work. They're one of the backbones of our conservation model. Uh, these conservation officers I run into, every one of them, want, they, they want to see you have success. We were down here at the Game and Fish office today talking to some of them. Absolutely nice people. Oh, think about this. Go here. Oh, hunting pressure is going to do this. Da, da, da. They want you to have success. So, uh, and when you think about it, they have a thankless job. Whenever they have to, quote, unquote, do their job, it's usually a bad situation where someone's violated a law, done something illegal, had a bad outcome, and think about this. Almost every person they encounter during hunting season is armed. I don't want their job, but 
Are we just about done, Marcus, or what are you thinking? We've been going for 50 minutes. Brian Clark says, how is your liver handling this season? So, so. Uh, when we hiked into the Wind River Range of Wyoming, uh, my liver crashed and we lost a day there. Uh, but, oh well, that's life. I can, I can sleep and rest when they put me in the ground. So, uh, My thoughts on Leupold BX3 Mojave Pro Guide HD. I got a pair of them out in the truck. I like them for the, va for the price. I think they are the best bino at that price point that you're going to find. Make sure to get the, the BX3 HD version when you do it, the Pro Guide. Uh, oh, let's see. Boy, these are going through. How's the Botec Rain working with your shoulder injury? How's the Botec Rain working with my shoulder injury? Extremely well. It works way, way better than I do. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, I love it. It is smooth, it's quiet, it's easy. It's, I don't know, just everything about it is, is wonderful. Um, I'm going to get to use it again some. Uh, this year, the only thing it killed was a grouse so far, but I'm going down to Arizona. Oh, if you're going to go to Arizona, have Alina hunting this winter like I am. The drawing, I think they're open for the tag applications right now, but I'm going down to Arizona and, in January, I'm hunting Havelina with my bow, and I'm hunting Coos Deer with my bow. So you're going to get to see the Rain 7, hopefully, in a lot of footage of me shooting Havelina and shooting Coos Deer. So. All right. I think we're doing good, Marcus. Folks, thanks so much for watching. Again, thank you to Botac, to Onyx, to Leupold, to Ripcord, Tight Spot, Black Gold, RMEF all the companies. Uh, I hope you'll be sharing this. And remember, uh, go to BowTechArchery.com and they got this really cool thing that says, I'm a bow hunter. Go there, get that, share it on social media, let people know, hey, I'm a bow hunter. I'm, a, I'm an ethical fair chase hunter. I do it the right way. I'm committed to conservation. And uh, don't be afraid to let the world know this is who you are. It's what I am. If you look at my business card, I don't have one with me. It doesn't say Randy Newberg CPA. It says Randy Newberg Hunter. I'm a hunter just like you are. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Next week will be Wednesday, normal time, 8 o'clock mountain time. Appreciate it, everyone. How'd we do, Marcus? Holy cow, 439 comments. How do we, how, how are we going to get through all those comments?